A series of lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his text, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics. And stand by for our future works, Introductory Mechanics, Harmonic Oscillators, Polymer Solution Dynamics, and Game Design. We now start Chapter 1, which treats the relationship between statistical mechanics and other sciences, and the position of statistical mechanics relative in particular to statistical mechanics and to thermodynamics. The basis of our analysis is the thinking of Thomas Kuhn, the great scientific philosopher of the 20th century, in particular his belief that most scientific theories had three basic features. They have explicit assumptions, which we call laws of nature, they have implicit assumptions, which are in fact as fundamental of laws of nature, but for various reasons, often historical, are not called laws of nature. Finally, they have examples, models, assumptions, things that allow you to take the very simple laws of nature, apply them to real physical systems, and get actual physical results. To demonstrate what is meant by Thomas Kuhn's thinking and to show where we are going with statistical mechanics, we're going to consider thermodynamics, the study of heat and chemical reactions, quantum mechanics, which is the study of, as relevant here, electron behavior, and compare these two with statistical mechanics. Each of these models has fundamental explicit assumptions, laws of nature. The laws of nature that drive thermodynamics are the so-called three laws of thermodynamics. The fundamental law of nature that applies to quantum theory that describes how electrons behave in atoms and in solids is the Schrodinger equation. Each of these is a fundamental equation and it is by applying these to particular systems that we get the results of thermodynamics and quantum mechanics. The explicit laws of nature are not enough to pull real results out of physical theories. For example, in quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation gives you the behavior of the wave function psi, but gives no particular indication as to what the wave function psi means. It, attempting to interpret the wave function psi was a major topic of science for a considerable period of time in the 1920s, finally leading to the Copenhagen interpretation that the mean square value of psi was related to a statistical probability. Similarly, if you want to apply thermodynamics, you can, for example, go through a logical process to attempt to derive the Gibbs phase rule, but at some point you end up at having a one-component one phase system and you have to know from some place that that system has precisely two degrees of freedom if it's for example an ideal gas. Finally we come to the exemplary problems the results of the model, the ways to use the model that for many people are learned through working homework problems. For example for quantum mechanics we have the hydrogen atom the hydrogen atom model is simple enough to be solved analytically and complicated enough to show how quantum mechanics handles atomic and molecular properties. Buried in the hydrogen atom model is the statement that the electron is a point charge. That's a very important assumption. If you instead believe that the electron was a spherical shell of charge, say the size of a grapefruit, and tried to calculate the hydrogen atom spectrum, you'd get some sort of answer, but not the one that you happen to find in the real world. That's why you do homework problems, and that's why you have physical inputs. Now we come to the basic physical assumptions of statistical mechanics. The first assumption is that there exists an exact microscopic description of any system that you are going to describe via statistical mechanics as a theory. 
By an exact microscopic description, I mean you have a list of variables that tells you everything that can be said about the mechanical properties of the system. Furthermore, if you have numerical values for all of those variables, you can calculate how the system evolves in time. The second assumption of statistical mechanics, which requires some examples to make clear, is that you get from microscopic descriptions to the thermodynamic variables in which one is generally interested by performing averages over the microscopic coordinates of the system. Which averages? That's why we have a considerably longer book than this one chapter. However, the averages in question are weighted averages and we have just reached the fundamental difference between the Boltzmann and Gibbs formulations of statistical mechanics. In the Gibbs formulation of statistical mechanics, the statistical weight depends exponentially, in, as indicated in the equation on the pane, on the energy of the system. As Gibbs put it, the log of the probability is linear in the energy of the system. Statistical mechanics also has an implicit assumption. The assumption links statistical mechanics to thermodynamics. As shown on the pane, an unweighted average of the statistical weight used in statistical mechanics is claimed to allow you to calculate the Helmholtz free energy of the system, the Helmholtz free energy being a fundamental thermodynamic free energy which links to all of the rest of the thermodynamic properties of the system. There is no direct proof of this implicit assumption, but Gibbs provides for it in his book an extremely strong plausibility. These assumptions are much more clear after you've worked an example or two. Traditionally, the first example worked is the ideal gas, and that's exactly the example that will be worked in later chapters. Historically, Boltzmann had a much more difficult time than Gibbs did in persuading people to believe his theory. The difficulty that Boltzmann collided with was that European physicists of his period, for the most part, did not believe in at the atomic theory of matter. This must have seemed very strange to the organic chemists who were already deducing fairly accurately what the structure of organic compounds are, namely where the atoms were placed with respect to each other. Gibbs faced no such challenge in large part because he worked entirely by himself and did not feel any need to convince anyone in particular that he was right because he already knew he was right and particularly when you are trying to learn a topic on your own over the internet as is supported by these lectures I strongly urge you not to stop with one book. There are several other excellent books on statistical mechanics. Gibbs' book on statistical mechanics is very hard reading and is usefully read at a later date. However, I would point out McCory's book on statistical mechanics. The first of Tolman's two books, that's the thinner one, not the much thicker 1938 book. And for more modern topics, note, for example, the book by Reichel. Our next chapter is a mathematical detour. We'll discuss certain aspects of probability and statistics that are relevant to this work, and we'll present a rationale for making use of the ensemble average in statistical mechanics calculations.